Been five games with right hamstring tightness, so he's back in the lineup. Then Dozier, Pasquantino, and Taylor, and the bottom third, Melendez, Garcia, and Lopez for the Royals. And they will be facing Nestor Cortez. And you see the numbers on Cortez, eight and three, 2.48. 106 strikeouts, 101 and two-third innings, 22 walks. How about the scatter report? Well, you guys talked about it. Back on track after a ridiculous start. He's been through a little tough stretch, but the last two outings have been really good. 13 innings combined, only one run and 11 strikeouts. Top five, still fifth in the American League in ERA at 2.48. So the great story continues. And trending up, his fastball's much better lately. Last two start hitters are two for 21 against his heater. And that's a great sign this time of year that you're not losing velocity. Well, try to nail this one down. The Yankees will try to nail down another series of victory. They've taken the first two of this four game set. The walk off home run by Judge on Thursday. Uh, the eight runs in the eighth inning yesterday. Two more judge home runs. A great catch as he is burnishing his MVP resume. So, so far so good against the Royals. Here's game three. Whit Merrifield is ready. Nestor Cortez is ready. And let's do it here in the Bronx. First pitch is fouled away and we are underway. Jordan Baker, the home plate umpire, Mark Carlson, the crew chief at first, Ramon De Jesus at second. Chris Guccione is over at third. Fly ball right field, giving Chase Carpenter. He's there, and he makes the play for the first out. Why don't we check out the Yankee defense brought to you by your local Tri-State GMC dealers. You've got Ben Intendi in left, Hicks in center, and Carpenter over in right. In the infield, it's Donaldson, Connor Falefa, Torres, and LeMayu. That's third to first. Trevino back behind the plate, catching Nestor Cortez. There's Bobby Wood Jr. Get a chance to see this good young talent. As I mentioned during the lineup, missed five days with right hamstring tightness. So we haven't seen him the first two games. But here he is, just 22 years old. High fly ball, left side. Everyone gives it a look, but it makes the seats out of play. Let's check out the keys to the game, brought to you by your local Kia dealers. Well, what's next? It has been the Aaron Judge show. Let's see what he can do today to impress us and a must watch. Yeah, Aaron Judge is, but also the guy at the plate, Bobby Witt Jr. We've heard so much about him. Fun to watch the future stars play for the first time. And keep swinging. 10 plus runs last night was the 14th time the Royals pitching staff has done that, which leads the major leagues. And by the way, the Yankees have done that 17 times, which also leads the major leagues. And Witt goes down on strikes. Well, a good start for Nestor getting that little fastball, maybe a little cut on it up and into Bobby Witt Jr. We know the weapons for Nestor Cortez. Fastballs in, cutters in. Did a really good job his last outing against Baltimore throwing backdoor cutters. I think that changed up the game plan for the O's. Here's Salvador Perez came off the IL and hit a three run home run on a 100 mile an hour fastball from the Yankees' Garrett Cole. And a strike to the Royals catcher. The Royals are 39 and 61. The Yankees are 68 and 33. Let's take a look at the uh, scouting report on Jordan Baker. He's hitter friendly. Fewer inside strikes, fewer low strikes. And he's in his 11th big league season he's going to get a Christmas card from O'Neill. <laughs> I like those green umpires right? <laughs> give you a chance at the plate. I'm sure Nestor didn't like the fewer inside strikes we know he likes to pound the ball inside on right handed hitters. Let's see if that'll be a factor moving forward. Fly ball to a four-man outfield. 
and the catch is made by Ben Intendi for the final out. So Cortez retires the Royals in order, one, two, three. And the Yankees are coming to bat. It's the day off. Then it's Glaber Torres at second, cleaning up Josh Donaldson at third, Matt Carpenter bat sixth and plays right. And the bottom third, center fielder Aaron Hicks, IKF in short, Jose Trevino will catch. And they will face Jonathan Heasley. This will be his 12th start, one and five, with a 5.50 ERA. Let's take a look at the scouting report. Well, July 9th, that was his last start. He's been out with some shoulder issues, and it, it has been a tough road all year, even before the injuries. First, fifth worst ERA in the American League at 5.50. And speed test, his velocity on his fastball way down. Started the year at 94-95. His last start before he went on the IL, he was in the high 80s. So keep track on if he has his arm strength back and his fastball back. Take a look at the defense behind him, brought to you by your local Tri-State GMC dealers. Hunter Dozier at left, Michael A. Taylor in center, and MJ Melendez. We've seen him behind the plate. He's in right. Infield Lopez, Garcia, Merrifield, and Pasquantino. Behind the plate, Salvador Perez catching Jonathan Easley. So here's DJ LeMayhew. LeMayhew's really had a bounce back season not that he had a terrible year last year but it wasn't LeMahieu like he has a 386 on base percentage sixth in the American League he has a 4.0 war which is seventh in the American League and he's done everything that you'd want a player to do including really strong defense at second and at third yeah I think back to Aaron Boone when LeMahieu's batting average was about 250 saying you know what I feel like he's swinging the bat better than his average dictates and he was right. Been multi-hit machine. The batting average up in the high 270s. High fly ball, deep center. Taylor back, still back. He's on the track, turning. See ya! Home run for LeMayu to start it off. One nothing Yankees. Which sure looked like a good swing off the bat. You knew it had a really good chance. His tenth home run of the year, 39th oh, RBI. Yeah. All of a sudden, the Royals, here we go again. Shell shocked by the Yankees. One to nothing. <laughs> 39th Ruby, as Paul mentioned, his 10th home run. Here is Aaron Judge. Judge has turned the 2022 season into a video game for himself. He's the star of MLB The Show 22. And you hear the crowd chanting MVP, and you know what? That's not hyperbole. Yeah, the ball's supposed to be away. You see it come back to the middle of the plate, and as DJ LeMay, who does, hits the ball where it's pitched. Just say, got that one up in the air, carried out to right center. One and two. Take a look at the swing on Super Shot, and when all the old timers were standing underneath the stadium, DJ LeMayu came walking by, and Charlie Hayes says, "You know, and I'm telling my son to hit the ball like you do. Fastball, hit it the other way. Off-speed, pull it, and a fastball that he drills to right center field." Flash, I don't know, and I mentioned it a few times. If you've ever seen a guy like a back foot hitter, like DJ LeMayhew is, hit the ball the other way like he does. Most guys have that transfer of weight to the front side to drive the ball the other way. He just allows the ball to travel that much deeper, almost to the plate, before he makes his decision. You watch this, you, there's not much of a weight transfer, but he's still able to just let the ball get deep where the contact is made almost at home plate and still able to drive it. Paul, I don't know if you agree with me, though, but when I would let the ball travel so much, I would have to drop my back shoulder just to make contact and would pop it up. He doesn't do that. He stays still stay on top. A base hit for Judge as his hot streak continues. 
Well, there was another conversation with the old timers, and it was why do they keep pitching to Aaron Judge? When is the league going to realize you just can't keep coming right at this guy? Looked like a little slider or cutter up. Speeds up his bat just a little bit, drills it through that hole. And you watch video after video, and, and the most things, the best thing you can do as a hitter is put yourself in the same position when the ball is in the hitting area. And Aaron Judge's videos pretty much all look the same. That's how consistent he's been. It's funny you mentioned the word consistent, Paul. I was talking to Dylan Lawson, the Yankees hitting coach, and I said, what's the one thing you think about Judge? He said, he's so steady. He said, there aren't peaks and valleys. He said, there's been one kind of mini slump where he hit 260 for about two weeks. He said, but for the most part, steady every single day. Same thing. And we expect that every single day. Well, I immediately think back to great hitters in their routine. They did the same thing every day. Went to the cage, did some flips. Went to batting practice, hit the ball the other way. Middle, then start hitting home runs where you don't get in that mode where I got to change things if I didn't have a good game. You just rinse and repeat every day, right, Paul? I agree. I mean, you get into schedules, and it's not like, you know, you're superstitious. It's just your schedule. This is how I prepare, and if I prepare the same way every day, you can expect the same thing, and that's uh, four or five good at-bats. 3-0 and oh on Ben and and there's ball four, so he works a walk, and easily with an inauspicious start, a home run, a single, and now a walk. Still nobody out for Glaber Torres. Mike Matheny looking on has got to be thinking, here we go again. But, you know, he has his veteran Sal Perez behind the plate today trying to go out there and calm down his pitcher. And a reminder, you're one pitch away from a double play ground ball. I know we haven't gotten off to a good start, but let's go pitch to pitch here and try to work our way out of some trouble. Let's look at the game time weather presented by Bigelow, the official hot tea of the Yankees. 86 degrees, it feels like 89. No chance of rain, humidity 34%. The wind out of the west, northwest at 13 miles per hour. You know what I like better than a green uh, scatter report for an umpire, Michael, is at zero on the Bigelow weather. Uh, no rain, uh, that, that, that's, that's a good forecast. I agree, we had some rain yesterday. It looks beautiful today. The clouds in the sky look like little cotton balls pinned up against a blue background. There's a visual for you, Paul. You love that. That just came out of one of your papers. You wrote it for them. <laughs> you see the job? He just he can paint pictures for you. Cotton balls against a blue sky. Yep. Brought a tear to my eye just listening to that, Paul. <laughs> Uh oh, Flash, we got a, a pitch tech malfunction. There we go. Let's test it. Yeah, we're good to go. center field long run for Taylor he's not going to get there it's off the base of the wall judge scores Ben and is almost right behind him and puts on the brakes at the last moment it's an RBI double for Torres and it's two nothing Yankees well it's amazing to me these first couple series the Yankees bats were kind of shut down early in the game they're so good late but again Glaber has had some great at bats and add this one to the pile just a beautiful swing driven to right center field. All of a sudden you put runs up against a, a team that's used to losing makes things a lot easier. Well, watch Ben Attendee coming around second base judge scores easy Luis Rojas holding Ben Attendee. A really good base running all the way around judge halfway once he reads it off the wall he scores easy. But ben Attendee he can run a little bit. Second and third, nobody out. Royals play the infield back. Here's Donaldson. Blocked by Perez. 
You know, when I see Sal Perez behind the plate today, Paul, I think about how I felt with the 98 Yankees when they would come up in the first inning and set the tone right away. You're just sitting there saying, I, I don't know where to go with my right-handed pitcher right now. These guys are laying out rockets the other way. If you don't throw it over the plate, they take their walks. Donaldson, a great opportunity early in this game. One and one. Yeah, Heasley's a guy that, you know, he's not overpowering, pretty much uses everything in the book as far as pitches. And so, you know, the, the, the tight strike zone is only going to hurt him. And the good at bats the Yankees have had so far are going to kill him. Foul back here. One and two. one of those confidence at bats for Donaldson right here you're behind in the count one and two second and third nobody out infield back it's just situational hitting at its best try to put the ball in play middle of the field worst case scenario pick up an RBI foul the way sometimes he's at best flash. when you're thinking small Paul sometimes you end up doing something big right yeah, you, you can't look at it as, you know, you're stepping out. I can't strike out. I can't strike out. It's all about, you know, hit the ball hard, hit the ball hard. So you, you want the positive outlook, not what I can't do, because you end up doing it. You think small, big things big happen. Things that's happens. Like, that's Does that like, bring a tear to your eye? Yeah, it's like cotton balls. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Your turn, Paul. Have anything to add to this? <laughs> I tell you, it might take the eighth or ninth inning before I come up with one. Well, you gave us kitty litter yesterday, so <laughs> swing and a miss as Donaldson down on strikes, one away. So, John, uh, sources tell me that O'Neill got 150 texts about his kitty litter. Positive or negative <laughs> texts? Did they like it? Just like. What are you talking? Everybody in the world knows I don't even have cats. So, I don't know. The, well, how it became relevant when I'm talking about kitty litter. Yeah, I understand. All right, so now with one out and Carpenter up, the Royals bring the infield in. Matt starting in right field today. Hitting 311, 14 homers, 35 rubies. He's four for his last 25. Foul back. Did he hold up? No, he did not. Uh, Cuccioni said he went around 0-2. Torres at second, Benintendi at third. One man out, two runs in. Yankees lead 2 0, bottom of the first. One and two. This has been a situation. I mean, Matt Carpenter's been so good, but he's been unbelievable with men in scoring position. So. Good opportunity for the Yankees to really put this game in their control here in the first inning. Two and two on Carpenter. When you watch those really good hitters, they, they, they have a calmness about them when they get two strikes. And that's what I see with Carpenter. He gets behind in the count, no big deal. Nice and relaxed. Let's get ready a little bit early, try to see the baseball and hit it hard. Three and two.
Heasley sets in the belt and deals. And that's a walk for Carpenter. Working his way back into the count to load the bases. They're always anxious to get back out on the mound. We talk about Heasley. He missed about three weeks with shoulder tendonitis. And then you come back against the New York Yankees. And all of a sudden, first inning, and like, this is what I missed. Now they drop back to double play depth, but they're in at the corners for Hicks. Now Hicks is not going to do easily any favors. He will take pitches. He worked a great at bat last night in that eight run eighth inning. Aaron Booney pointed that out. And he's very selective at the plate. So he's easily going to have to throw strikes. And he's in the driver's seat now. You can cut that plate in half, either look middle away or middle in. It's not there, take it. Foul back and out of play. Fifteen of the last 19 batters have reached base safely. That goes back to last night and the eighth inning. Royals have a four-game losing streak. Yankees have a two-game winning streak. Royals probably playing with some uneasiness with the trade deadline approaching. There are rumors about Whit Merrifield and Michael A. Taylor. They've already traded Ben Intendi. 1-1. One, 1-2 one. One caught the outside corner. That one is looped to left field. It is a foul ball. Just foul. Boy, that would have been a beauty there, Flash. A little jam shot double down the line with bases loaded. It just foul. Lopez is going to help the umpire. It's a wide left. <laughs> just missed. Looks like he uh, lost a bat on that one. Paul, you mentioned all the time that Heasley has missed with that shoulder issue. Now you have 30 pitches already in the first inning. <laughs> and you've only had one out fighting your way to get through this, get a little break. You know the bullpen for the Royals is not one of their strengths, and 30 pitches in the first inning is not going to help. Check swing. Two and two. And the bullpen is up already. Yo Yoel Pariams. Three and two. And for a guy who missed three weeks on the IL, he's at 32 pitches here with one out in the first inning. Yeah, Mike Matheny has to protect him a little bit, obviously, coming back from some shoulder issues. But 3-2, what's the pitch going to be? Can he throw a changeup for a strike, or does he come right at Aaron Hicks with a fastball? Let's see if they turn two. There's one. On to first, it's a double play. He got just what he needed. But the Yankees get two runs, they leave two, and it started this way. DJ LeMayu went the other way into the Yankee bullpen, his 10th home run of the year. We go to the second, it's 2 nothing Yanks. Mr. Cortez has two runs to work with, 2 nothing Yankees as we start the second. And the pitch to Hunter Dozier is a little bit up, I guess, 1-0. Dozier 0 for 8 in the first two games of the series. Longer stretch, 4 for his last 24. But this has been a bounce back season for him. 
He's at 257, nine homers and 33 runs batted in. Waves through that pitch, two and one. Yeah, Dozier kind of showed the Royals what he could do in 2019. He had 26 home runs and led the major leagues with 10 triples and hit 280. So they expect him to get back to that point. And it's, uh, you know, it, it is a ballpark that I always liked hitting in Kansas City flash but it numbers wise say it's really not a great hitters ballpark what do you think yeah I was going to get your impression because I felt like it was a big ballpark but when you hit it good the ball carried and would get out of the ballpark do you agree with that I, I always liked hitting I did, that was one of the you know the ballparks that you look forward to going to not just because the Royals were kind of having down years and you know you won there but it was just it was a pretty ballpark you know it was just a, a fun place to play yeah, I guess I bring that up because I asked Rex Hudler, one of their analysts, about Benintendi coming over and what we can expect. And he said, you know, he, he really wasn't hitting the ball out of the ballpark because we have a big ballpark. But I think he's going to do some damage at Yankee Stadium. And it just made me think I always felt like the ball carried pretty good in Kansas City. Well, that's a walk to Dozier as Benintendi does some light reading to see where he's supposed to stand for Pasquantino. I had trouble with those cards, Michael, because you remember Bernie used to laugh at me all the time because I wore a little circle out there in right field. I pretty much stood where I wanted to stand, at, you know, just in one area. So if, it, if that card told me to move, I, I would have had a little issue. I hope the card is laminated because everybody sweats, right? Wouldn't it just run or disintegrate? <laughs> yeah, you would think it would have to be laminated. That's a base hit for Pasquantino. Dozier will stop at second. So first and second, nobody out for KC. Well, if you're Mike Mastini, this is what you want to see. Young players fighting back in a game after a long first inning. All of a sudden, they have something going here in the second. He's been around baseball a long time, 13 year career as a catcher, mostly with Milwaukee and the Cardinals. We talked to yesterday. This is his third year with Kansas City. Six years with the Cardinals, one World Series, which they lost, but uh, he's been a successful manager. And I think Kansas City is putting things in his hands as far as trying to get this team back to the playoffs. Always note when other teams come out in their dugout for Old Timers Day. And a lot of the Royals are on the top step, and Mike Matheny was right there as well. Great appreciation for the game and baseball history, and he just took in all the interest. Yeah, he looked like he was locked in, yep. paying attention to the ceremony. It's not an easy job managing the Kansas City Royals, a team that's struggling, and you have some veteran players, Michael, that you talked about. You know, Michael A. Taylor, Merrifield, possibly being moved here in the next couple of days. Not an easy clubhouse to navigate these days. Taylor fouls it back, still 0-2. Way outside. Yesterday, the Yankees scored 11 runs. It's the 17th time that they scored 10 or more runs in a game. No one in baseball, no other team, 
has more than 10 of those games. Yankees have 17 of them. Colorado, the Dodgers, Milwaukee, and the Mets have 10 double-digit games. So the Yankees have done damage with their offense. and Did it again last night with that eight-run eighth. This is their 29th comeback win of the season. That's the best in the game. And their 39th win against 12 losses in the Bronx. That's the best home record in the game. Fly ball, right field, Carpenter. Tagging is Dozier. The throw comes into second, one away. One thing you notice about Carpenter, he tracks the ball very well for a guy who doesn't, really hasn't played the outfield. The one thing that tells you not an outfield, he doesn't have a good arm. He has an infielder's arm. But he, he goes out to the ball quite well. One down, that'll bring up Melendez. Playing right field today. Caught the last two games. Tap slowly back to Cortez. And he runs right at the runner, throw to third, and they will get Dozier for the second out. Nice play by Cortez. Boy, I tell you one thing, that is an athletic play to come off the mound as a lefty and get to this ball and then immediately know where you're going and cutting him off before he can get by him and going back and then slipping and making a decent throw. A lot of good things happened here for Nestor. I totally agree. And whenever you see a pitcher go down and then come up and flip the baseball, you think bad thoughts, they could airmail this anywhere and Paul I think pitchers are so used to throwing off the mound where they have a delivery when you put him in a situation like you said to be an athlete sometimes it gets away from him a big out for <laughs> Nestor nice play here's Michael Garcia picked up his first three big league hits last night so he settled in This is a young player where you, you know, you look at what he did in the minor leagues, but you know, you went into last night hitting zero. And then the, today you can look up at the scoreboard and you're hitting 333 just by throwing three three hits out there in the first, uh, you, your first week of Major League Baseball. Two and one. That one clips the outside corner. Two and two on Garcia. Where Nestor is so good, realizing and recognizing where a hitter's looking for the baseball. We know the scatter report, fastball's in, cutter's in, keeping the ball away from Garcia to get to the 2 2 count. Swing and a foul ball. Fouled it twice. Flash most guys with that closed of a stance are away from the plate and then they kind of dive to get to that outside corner. And you watch Garcia, his movement is actually kind of away from the plate as he opens up from a closed stance. Strike three. Garcia down looking, so Cortez works out of a jam. No runs a hit. Nine and one in the Yankees order against Easley. Easily looked as if he was going to get knocked out of the game, but he uh, collected himself, got that double play ground ball off the bat of Aaron Hicks, and he lived to tell another story here in the second inning. Yeah, without that double play, you don't know if he would be out here in this second inning. I mean, he was, <laughs> uh, you're not going to have that long of a leash, obviously, coming off the IL with shoulder problems. Grounded and backhanded by Lopez. The long throw. One away. When 
you have that elevated pitch count in the first inning. You're trying to get some quick outs here in the second. Breaking ball and a nice backhand play by Lopez. The accurate throw. A couple of pitches, one down here in the second. That looks so easy on TV and, uh, you know, from a distance. But, boy, that's a, that's a tough play. A day game, you don't pick up the ball well. Nicky Lopez, you love the way he started out low and then kind of gradually brought it up to get the hop, but uh, that ball was hit hard. Two and all on Trevino. Guys, I'm thinking back to the time in between innings when you have a starting pitcher who's struggling in the first. He goes into the dugout, Sal Perez. I'm sure the catcher is having conversations. Cal Eldred, the pitching coach, trying to figure out what you have to do to get back on track in the second. And you're behind in the count 2 0 to Trevino, now 3 0, not what you want to be doing. And if you look at the end result, though, Flash, I mean, you're down two to nothing. I mean, yeah. that could have been a huge number in the first inning. So, you know, you've got to try to figure out, you know, if I can get through three or four innings, only give up a couple runs, that's a decent start after what I did in the first inning. There's a base hit to right field for Trevino. One out single, Yankees fourth hit. Let's take a look at Heasley's arsenal on StatCast 3D, powered by Google Cloud. See the four-seamer he uses the most? Amazing how good a control they have on StatCast. They never missed the box. All strikes. Every pitch is a strike. One and zero on Lemayhu. Started off the bottom of the first inning with a home run into the Yankee bullpen in right center. His nickname is La Machine. And you see, he's on base a lot when Judge Homer, so he has 64 runs scored. That's third in the American League. And since 2014, he has 1,352 hits. And that's fourth in the major leagues. He's a hitter. What he does. Two and one. Well, the Royals have the shift on Merrifield shifting up the middle, so a huge hole between first and second, and just looks so inviting with LeMayu swing. Fight it off the other way for a base hit, stay back on a breaking ball, drive it the other way. Fly ball right field. Melendez comes on to make the play. Two down, that brings up Judge. Flash, I don't know if you've noticed, but if, if you've watched, sorry, now you've gone through the lineup one time and you just turned it over to LeMay who had his second at bat, but there has not been an awkward swing yet from the Yankees, which to me means that he's, he's not fooling anybody. Guys are seeing the ball, even the outs are just missed or have been hit hard. Yeah, I always go back to the catcher behind the play, right? You're, you're trying to recognize that one pitch you can go to in a big spot, and we haven't seen it yet. Swing and a miss. Let's take a look at Bounty Quick Stats on Aaron Judge. 11 home runs in 13 games, second Yankee all-time to do that, and A-Rod did it in April of 2007. A lot of people, you know, we were talking last night, can you remember a season like this for a player? And, and the one that I came up with thinking about it overnight was, was Alex in 07 when he won the MVP. That was an unbelievable year. Mm -hmm. Two 
One and two. You know, to his credit, Alex Rodriguez, it was just like every year you started just to expect him do things like that. I mean, is, a lot of guys have breakout years. Aaron Judge had an unbelievable rookie year, and then he's had some injured years, and then back on it again this year. But Alex Rodriguez, day in and day out, every year, you know, was putting up numbers that other shortstops, other players weren't putting up. Look at the numbers Judge is putting up. Look at the categories that he leads all of the majors in. Pretty special. One, two. Two and two. Sitting at 89 RBIs and 41 runs batted in. And he's also sitting on 199 career home runs. So the next one will be a nice round number. And if he hits one today and gets to 200, he will get to that number faster than anyone in big league history except for Ryan Howard. He has to do it today? No, he's got a couple of days. Ryan okay. Howard, yeah. Uh, he, this would be 671. Ryan Howard did in 638 games. full numbers that the fastest to 200 home runs in big league history is Ryan Howard did it in 658 games so judge is at 671 right now he's got time because the next closest is Ralph Kiner who did it in 706 games then Juan Gonzalez 766 Horman Killebrew 769 and Albert Bell in 769. High drive, right field, Melendez back on the track. See ya, there's 200. Another home run for Aaron Judge, number 42. RBI's 90, 91. Amazing. The number 99s in the stands are all standing O. And again, I mean, uh, you're just starting to expect this. This is just a line drive that hit by a guy that hits the ball harder than most people. And it ends up in the first row. But again, 200 home runs, another one on the board, 2022. Aaron Judge, you're having some kind of year. But Paul, you're right. It's just a two strike hitting approach, right? Just shorten up and let me put the ball in play the other way and he drills it on a line drive for a two run shot. Again and you're wondering with all these opposing pitchers they're trying to sneak the fastball by Aaron Judge with two strikes and he just can't do it. Great play by the fan out in right field. Again, I mean, if you look at this swing, last night's home runs, everything, they look like carbon copies. And that gives you the best chance as a hitter to put yourself in the same position every single time. Ground ball by Ben Intendi, fielded by Merrifield, and that will do it. And that guy does it again. 42 home runs, 91 ribbies, and with this swing, a nice, even, 200 career home runs. The march to the MVP continues. It is historic. He does not know that he has ever seen anything like this. Certainly not from a teammate. He went on to say one of his only regrets is that he can't be like one of these fans in the stands with their camera phone out taking video of all these magical moments that Aaron Judge has had so far this season. As far as his manager Aaron Boone, well, pretty cool moment when he sat down for his postgame press conference. He didn't even finish sitting in the chairs, guys, and a question wasn't even asked. He just said, amazing. He is amazing. I know exactly what you guys are going to ask me and who you're going to ask me about.
There's a line drive to left field, the base hit in front of Ben Intendi for Lopez to start off the third inning. Another good line was Judge hit his 40 um, first home run with the grand slam in the eighth inning yesterday, and, and Boone was standing next to Ben Intendi. And he just looked at Ben Intendi and said, He's got 41 home runs. And Michael, it was pretty funny as well. Remember back to the first inning yesterday, he robbed the Royals of a home run. Aaron Boone also said, should he have 42 already? Because he saved one in my mind, it's 42. So I guess that makes today 43, if by his math. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It, it, it just is. I mean, there's no other words. I mean, we're, we're, we're at a loss for words because, you know, we've seen so many baseball games combined and I mean, you just don't see runs like this. Yeah, Aaron Boone is making me feel better because I don't know what to say anymore. And it seems like he's getting to these press conferences after the game and he's losing the ability on how to describe it because he's making it look so easy. And we all know it's it's not that easy. Yeah, you look at it in and, and I kind of thought about when I was watching Aaron Boone speak last night, it's very hard for me for Aaron Boone for Flash to comprehend the ability to do this yes. because I mean sure you can hit a home runner once once in a while but you, you just don't throw up numbers like this and it's just very hard even ex major league players very hard to comprehend somebody can do things like this because you didn't have that that kind of ability. Yeah, that's usually my gauge when you see professional athletes marvel at something going on because you guys have been there and done that know how hard it is to do so if it takes your breath away it, it tells you how amazing it really is 3-0 count on Merrifield there's a strike Yankees lead 4-0 so he's at 42 home runs now and we're still in July no Yankees ever done that Three and two. Speaking of round numbers, Merrifield's at 999 hits in his career. Foul back. Speaking of dates, Michael, still in July. I want to wish my mother a happy birthday. 95 years old. Today. All right. Wow. Like yeah. That, huh? I hope, you know, if I flip a coin, I hope I have her genetics. That's a long time. Wow. You know that she's still, still doing a lot of good things, too. Happy birthday, Mrs. O'Neill. Follow the way. You know who else is looking at the game notes? Uh, it's an, always an interesting story to me, obviously being in Cincinnati, was Joe Nuxall. And Joe Nuxall was the youngest pitcher to ever pitch in the major league during the war times. There weren't enough people. And they, he was 15 years old where they just <laughs> kind of grabbed him off the bench, threw him out on the mound. But uh, he meant so much to me. He was a broadcaster with Marty Brenneman with the Reds for years. And still to this day, he used to sign off every game. That one's driven to left field. Ben Intendi will watch it off the wall. He'll play it in, fire it into second from Merrifield. His 1,000th hit, it's a double. And the Royals have runners on second and third, nobody out. Well, Merrifield, we've talked about it. I mean, he has been a very, very kind of quiet, really good major league player. And whether he'll be here past Tuesday, that's yet to be seen. But 1,000 hits, that's always a feather in a cap of anybody that puts on a major league uniform. I want to finish the, about Joe Nuxall uh, at the top of the stadium here in Cincinnati Ohio it says rounding third heading for home and that's the way that Joe Nuxall used to sign off every night at the game but can you imagine flash taking the mound in a major league <laughs> game at 15 years old. It was a backup catcher on my high school team at 15 years old. It's <laughs> crazy. The 0 1. 
0-2 on Bobby Witt Jr. And Nestor Cortez realizing there's a hole up in the zone against Bobby Witt Jr. He exploited it the first at bat, going right back to it. Two elevated fastballs to get ahead. Four nothing Yankees. But the Royals threatening Yankees for the infield back of course with a four run lead. One and two. Swing and a miss. Got him upstairs. One away. That's what you've noticed recently, Flash, is you're getting some swing and misses again with that fastball. The time where he was going through some tough times, we were seeing a lot of pitches put in play, a lot of the fastballs fouled off. All of a sudden, as you watch it in super shot, slow shot, uh, you're seeing swing and misses again, which means life is back on the fastball. You know what you like too, Paul? He set up that elevated fastball to pitch before by going down and changing an eye level and then coming right back mm -hmm. to where he wanted to get the swing and a miss. So they look from behind. Nestor Cortez coming right into your living room just above the hands. It was set up by a low fastball to pitch before. Every pitch that a pitcher delivers will either set up a pitch coming after it or it will tell the pitcher some information about the, what the hitter is trying to do against him. Nestor Cortez, as you watch his games and you break it down, he's as good as any pitcher picking up tendencies, picking up holes, being able to exploit him. 0-1 on Perez. Perez back in the lineup last night after the thumb injury with the big home run against Cole. But you know, the more you look, and we showed it on the screen last night at his resume, pretty impressive stuff. I mean, he's 32 years old, 11 season, seven time All Star, five time Gold Glover. We looked at this, this was 100 mile an hour. I'm wondering if he was going to be up to the task after hurting his hand. Well, that answered a lot of questions, but he has had some kind of career. For a catcher that likes to be behind the plate, as you said, Michael, every single day. Yeah, I don't think he believes in load management, Paul. <laughs> Another thing I was reading I thought was interesting he was born just days apart. Uh, Jose Altuve, they both grew up in Venezuela playing together, and, and, and it just. When you look at stories like that, I mean, here's two kids that played against each other, and uh, Altuve was quoted as saying, I knew he was going to be a major leaguer. And so, uh, pretty cool story. Now, the home run that he hit off of Cole yesterday, that's the hardest pitch that he'd ever homered off in his career. One and two. Who do you pat on the back there, Flash? I mean, do you pat Perez on the back for catching up or because Cole throws 100? I mean, <laughs> not a lot of guys throw 100 to start with. I, I was just thinking, I remember Mark Waller's throwing 100 miles an hour, and I was like, I have never seen anything like that. We talk about 100 now like it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. High fly ball, deep left center. Going back is Hicks. He's there to make the catch. Tagging is Lopez. He'll score easily. A long sack fly off the bat <laughs> of Perez. The Royals are on the board. It's 4 1 Yanks. Boy, if you saw Nestor's reaction to this, I don't think that he uh, thought this was coming back. A little pirouette and a grunt and a growl. He really thought it was out. <laughs> Here's Dozier. He walked in the second. That one's fouled straight back.
The 0-1. 0-2 on Dozier. Along with Paul O'Neill, John Flaherty, Merrick Morakovitz, I'm Michael Kay, and we certainly thank you, as we always do, for spending part of your day. Today, it's a Saturday with us here on the Yes Network. Top of the third inning, it's 4-1 Yankees over the Royals. Now, I've just tuned in late. Well, I'm sorry, you missed a judge home run. You can't tune in late anymore. <laughs> Super Stash Brothers. That's Carpenter and Nestor. So two and two now. Runner at second. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Cortez gets out of further trouble. One run, two hits, one man left. It was great to see Diana Munson today. Had some time to spend with her. And Kay Mercer wanted me to say hello to everybody at Yes, saying how much she misses everybody. And of course, we all miss Bobby, so we had a good time catching up about that. They all look great, by the way. They really do. They really do. Great spirits, too. And one of the, I thought one of the highlights of, of the old timers day, and you see Kay Mercer after she's introduced, was Thurman's son Michael catching the first pitch from Ron Guidry. That was kind of a goosebump moment, and he made a nice play as Guidry threw a 45 pitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 45 foot pitch. <laughs> Did a good job picking it, keeping it in front. And it kind, kind of looks a little like his dad. Son, Michael Munson. And here it is. Nice. And there's Diana Munson. Boys were giving Gator a little hard time after that, <laughs> as you would expect. Now, Meredith, you spoke to Ron Guidry, right? I did, Michael, and he said he was just so excited to be back. This is the first Old Timers Day since 2019 because of the pandemic, and he said it is a day that he always circles on his calendar. He puts those pinstripes on, and all the memories start coming back. Now, I was doing an interview with him for our pre-show, and his retired number is behind us in the background, and I said, when you look at that, do you smile? And he said, of course I do, but when I was playing, I never knew if I was good enough. I really never knew if I was good enough. It wasn't until that number was retired that I thought, well, I guess I must not have been too bad. I think he was better than not too bad, guys. I think we can agree with that. Paul, you're going to feel like that on August 21st? Uh, it still to this day blows me away when I look at those numbers and know that uh, I want it to happen before they change their mind, Michael. How's that? <laughs> you know, one of the coolest things, Meredith, and I'm sure that you were out there when he was doing it, Bernie Williams was taking selfies in front of his plaque. I thought that was so neat. Well, he told me he has not been out there in a while. So he had, it had been a little while. He's like, I, I like to come out here and see it every now and again. So yeah, he was taking the selfies. I had the opportunity to speak with him as well. And you know, this 2022 team gets compared a lot with that 1998 team. Lined right at Lopez to retire Donaldson. And Bernie told me he could really relate to it because he feels like this team, when they go to the ballpark, any ballpark, any day, they feel like they're going to win. And he told me that is how we always felt in 1998, that same emotion. So as he watches this season unfold, it reminds him a little bit of that 1998 season. Uh, but still a lot of baseball left to be played and a lot of business to handle in the postseason, Michael. Bernie looked great. He looked so comfortable there coming in and standing in center field. Just a nice moment. Here's Matt Carpenter. Now, Paul, you have a lot of connections in Hollywood. You know, every time we see things go on in Monument Park, I just think of the movies Night at the Museum. At night, those plaques should come alive and all those people should talk. <laughs> oh, Baseball. Beautiful. Beautiful. I tell you one thing, I'd be sitting on the outer ranks just kind of listening because there's some, some big names oh. out there. 
Now, who would you want to listen in on the most? You know all the guys out there. Who would you want to listen in the most? Well, obviously, I mean, as you look, Bernie, I mean, Bernie's a fan favorite. But, I mean, the the, the, the stories about Babe Ruth, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you, you want to know if half of them are really, or, or have we embellished the stories or are they real or, you know, I, I had the, the honor of actually talking to Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio and, and Yogi Berra. But, you know, we didn't get to talk to Babe Ruth. I, I, we just get to hear about what he did and how he changed the game of baseball. I think I'd be listening with you. Or I'd have you recorded for me. <laughs> Carpenter with a fly ball to center. And Heasley has recovered and he retires the Yankees in order. 14th with a low grade last strain, a little less severe than one he suffered earlier in his career. Aaron Boone said he's made some significant progress after being shut down for two weeks. He is expected to start a throwing program on Monday. Michael, still no timeline for a return for Luis Severino, but the fact that he's picking up a ball again, well, that is a good sign for the Yankees rotation. Absolutely, and they're going to take it slow but steady. They have a nice lead in the American League East, so there's no need to push it. And... Um, if he gets back and returns to what he was when he was healthy at the beginning of the year, that'd be a great late season acquisition. You know, the way the uh, the basic agreement has set up baseball, the last change that you could really make to your team is August 2nd. That's it. That's the trade deadline. And your team has to be set for two months. So guys coming back from injuries after that August 2nd date, that's a big boost for a team. Mm-hmm. He looks like he's in good spirits. <laughs> Pasquantino pops it up, right side. LeMahieu battling the sun, makes the play for the first out. You know, when that trade went down yesterday with Castillo from the Reds going to Seattle, to me, I think you had to make, really make a decision. Now, a lot of Yankee fans were disappointed, obviously, because we saw Castillo, how good he is. But I think a lot has to do with the health of uh, Severino. How serious was his injury? Is he going to come back and be the type of pitcher that he was? And if he is, then you know the, the the trade doesn't mean anything because you're bringing a star pitcher back into the rotation. Now Brian Cashman really plays his cards close to the vest. I mean. The strong implication was that the Yankees did want Castillo, that he was number one on their list, and that they made a representative offer, and they ended up uh, trading him to Seattle, and uh, just uh, further put salt into the wound if the Yankees did miss out on him. He's going to pitch in the series coming up Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday when the Yankees face the Mariners. So they faced him against the Reds, and he was great, and now they're going to face him in his new team against the Mariners. Yeah, I always feel like Brian Cashman, though, when everybody's talking about, oh, the Yankees are in on Castillo, the Yankees are in on this guy. As Taylor lines a base hit back up the middle, I always think that Brian Cashman is working behind the scenes and something that we never hear about that surprises you a little bit. Comes out of left field that gives the Yankees a boost. Rizzo last year, we had no idea, didn't hear anything about mm -hmm. that, and all of a sudden he was a Yankee. So a lot of work to be done before the deadline. And we told you this earlier, want to remind you, starting at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, and Tuesday's the deadline, we will have live reports all day on the Yes Network. Um, back at the studio, Jack Curry working his magic. Uh, Meredith and I will be here as well at the stadium. So anything breaks, uh, tune to Yes, and we will have it. And then, of course, we'll have the game on Tuesday night. It's always an exciting time of year for the for the teams that are you know bringing players in to make that run to win a World Series, and I, I think it's always a kind of a shot in the arm to the teams that are, that are competing. And now with the you know the expanded wild card, more teams are are, are going to be able to do these things. So I think it's good for baseball. But uh, I also remember when, you know, when we brought in Cecil Field or we brought in Straw, we brought in Justice. I mean, we brought in guys, and they it just seemed to fit perfectly. And it, it's got us over the hump uh, a couple of years. And, you know, it can help you win a World Series. David Cohn, I mean, bringing guys in like that, you win World Series with players like that. And it also, as you said, Paul, sends a message to the team, we're all in. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, I hate to use the word desperate because I'm not out there. But Seattle traded three of its top five prospects from its minor league system to get Castillo. And, well, why'd they do that? They haven't made the playoffs since 2001. That's a long time. That's the longest stretch in the big leagues. So, I mean, if Seattle sat back and, and prospect hugged, as we call it, well, the manager and the GM might not be there when those players become ready to play. So they want to win now. Mm-hmm. Three and two on Melendez, runner on first, one man out. We're in the fourth inning. It's 4-1 Yankees over KC. Melendez works a walk. So I'll tell you what, the Yankees are leading four to one, but Nestor all day seems like he's teetering on getting into big trouble. Yeah, 73 pitches already. He's have to he's had to work awfully hard. So this is going to be a bullpen afternoon. But I'm impressed with Melendez, who just worked that walk left on left. We've seen him behind the plate, We've seen him have good at bats. The Royals might have something there. So here's Garcia. And that one is looped into center field. It is a base hit. Taylor rounds third. They're going to wave him home. He'll score easily without a throw. Throw is to third. It's an RBI single for Garcia. Now it's 4 2. Last year, always talking about Nestor being able to get in on the right handed hitters. And again, this ball jams him, but enough of it to get it to the outfield and score a run. So the Royals have cut the Yankee lead in half. It was 4 nothing after two. But a run in the third, now a run in the fourth. Now runners on first and second with one out for Nicky Lopez. He singled to left in the third. Benintendi moves toward the line, and he's in very shallow left field. And Hicks is in very shallow center. Think back to Lopez in his last at bat. He went the other way against Nestor Cortez, left on left. Paul, you and I talked about this last night. You can get in on the hands of a left handed hitter if you're Nestor Cortez. Recognizing what Lopez was trying to do his first at bat. We'll see if there are any adjustments here in the second. Well, the Yankees were working on these plays the other day at about 4.15 in the afternoon. That throw to second with the infield recovery. Ooh. Yeah, a lot of times, uh, you know, these pickoffs are just to show, but I mean, a good throw and handle possibly has him at second base. LeMayu goes to second one on to first. It's a double play. LeMayu with a beautiful throw to second, the return throw. Gets the speedy Lopez for the inning ending double play. Royal score one on two hits. One man left on base. A strong return throw, and the inning is over. The order starting with Aaron Hicks. Now here's an eye opening stat that I, I can't explain. Maybe John and Paul can. So Hicks came up with the bases loaded in the first inning and wrapped into a 4-6-3 double play. Yankees could have blown the game open right there. He's now 9 for 62 in his career with the bases loaded. Popped up. Almost become metal blocks. This ball's going to give a little problem. Lopez comes up with it. 
but they they it becomes a mental thing where you you put yourself in that position and you know you have not succeeded before and it just you try too hard and you you can do it with bases loaded you could do it any time a runner's in scoring position uh, some years uh, you, you know it, it automatic I'm going to get a base hit and some years you fight those things and uh, it just sounds like career wise you know, that's one of those things one of the, that he's reminded every time the base is loaded or he has not done this well in his career. IKF pops it up to Garcia he dropped the ball. Kind of nonchalanted it without using both hands and he dropped the ball to allow IKF to reach on what will obviously be I shouldn't say this E6. Well we think back to last night's ball game and Garcia the same thing a routine ground ball not able to come up with it just casual right there. That's just the play. Obviously not having any trouble with the sun just very casual and doesn't come up with it. That's a very glaring E6. Here's Trevino first to throw over. You know, Michael getting back to Aaron Hicks and the base is loaded. I, I think if a hitter could get in the mind of a pitcher and catcher when it's a bases loaded situation and you know the stress and the anxiety that this game could be blown open with one swing of the bat. So I think from a hitter standpoint you go up there not realizing the pitcher is in big time trouble as opposed to I have the bases loaded I have to get it done. Well, I guess one guy that really or one of the people that solved that and had that mindset was Pat Tabler who's now a broadcaster for the Blue Jays in his career with the bases loaded 88 plate appearances he hit 489. Now Aaron Hicks is a good player. He's not a player that should go nine for 62 in these situations but as Paul said you know kind of channeling Yogi you know 90 percent of the game is half mental. <laughs> Foul back 0 and 2. Wyatt Mills is up for Kansas City. Trevino has really turned himself into a good hitter 260 batting average 30 RBIs but the ability to spoil the pitcher's pitch and just foul it off to give yourself another chance a great job of hitting spoiling the good slider off the plate with two strikes now you get another pitch another chance line foul. If the Yankees win today or tomorrow it will be their 14th straight series win against Kansas City. Last time Kansas City won a series against the Yankees May of 2015. And that was the year that the Royals won the World Series. Rounded to third. Let's see if they turn two. There's one. No, they throw it away. Another error by the Royals. IKF will stop at third. Trevino reaches at first. We talk about Merrifield and how good a solid player he is and just does not come up with the throw. Looked like a good throw, just kind of lost it and went off the end. Looks like the fingers of his glove just didn't glove the ball. Easy double play. Well, Paul, he's got the sunglasses on. I'm wondering if maybe the white shirts and a day game in the stand, something. I mean, this is a play that Whit Merrifield makes in his sleep. Mm -hmm. So an E6 and now an E4 up the middle, deserting the Kansas City Royals. And here's LeMayu, first and third, one man out. And a strike. A 
Owen 2. The Audi Electric Moment. Experience a fully electric Audi vehicle. Your local Tri-State Audi dealer today. This okay. was in the first. It's one way to start off a ball game. Driving a ball into the Yankee bullpen just to the right of center field. Tenth home run of the year. The Yankees get off on a good start. And there's a base hit to left center field. Connor Falafa scores. Trevino will go to third. It's an RBI single for LeMahieu, and it's 5 2 Yanks. You wonder why DJ LeMahieu is such a good hitter over his career average wise. It's because he can handle any kind of speed. And that, that change up, you kind of pull it. Fastball goes the other way, stays through it, doesn't come off of it. Another run on the board for the Yankees. Well, that's going to do it for Heasley. This base hit drives him from the game. His defense certainly deserted him. Mike Mathidi is going to the bullpen, and Aaron Judge is coming up with runners on first and third. One man out, and the Yankees up by three. The American League record. So Wyatt Mills has the honor of facing Judge. First and third, one man out. Judge with a two-run home run in the second. His 200th career home run, 42nd home run of the year. Now to put it into even more of a an amazing stat, Judge had one home run in his first 13 games this year. So he's kind of picked it up. There's a strike. Well, and Aaron Judge looks at the iPad with what Mills has. You can see that low three-quarter arm angle. And have a little run on his fastball and a sweeping slider away from him. As a hitter, you got to set your sights just a little bit lower, pick up that hand, pick up the baseball. One and one. Judge now over 300 again at 301. 42 homers, 91 ribbies. Two and one. So 41 home runs in the last 86 games. First player since Stanton did it with Miami when he won the MVP in 2017. The phones are out. The gloves are out. Everybody's ready. Aaron Judge high alert. Three and one. Concession stands are bald. Nobody's in line. <laughs> Everybody's in their seats. Around the tri-state, bathrooms not being used right now. <laughs> First and third, one man out. Mills on to face Judge. In relief of Heasley. Three and two. Slider on a fastball count there, three and one to make it three and two. You got to be thinking, Mills probably going to try to sweep that slider out over the plate to Aaron Judge, and we talked about it last night after the game. He is just so disciplined these days that if you don't come over the plate in that strike zone, Aaron Judge will just take his walk. Three, two. Inside a walk that'll load the bases for Ben Intendi. The Yankees baseball on yes is brought to you in part by Delta, the official airline of the New York Yankees. Delta, keep climbing. John, is it is it too early in a game to to say if a base is open the way Judge is hitting right now? Why do you pitch to him? I I would be saying that if I was in a pitcher catcher meeting at this point from the first at bat of the game. I mean, you really? just can't give in to this guy right mm -hmm. now. I mean, he's he's wrecking games early. And obviously, that was a slider that got away from Mills, but it's gotten to the point you just can't pitch to him anymore. 
Benintendi swings and misses. And it, it just becomes so important for guys like Benintendi, guys for like Rizzo to keep swinging the bat to protect Aaron Judge to make sure he gets pitches to hit moving forward. The 0 1. Oh. 1 and 1. So. Benintendi has moved around the order in his three games first fifth and now third today with Rizzo giving the day off and Aaron Boone said he's he's one of the hitters in our lineup that you you really could put him anywhere he's had good numbers against pitchers with runners in scoring position in 299 one one popped up left side coming on Dozier toward the line still coming slides and makes the catch Tagging is Trevino. He will score. It's a sack fly from Benintendi, and it's 6-2 Yanks. Boy, this could have been trouble. This is a really nice play by Dozier. Uh, obviously a visiting player not knowing the ballpark well, but a sliding catch and a good job by Trevino to make sure that he was back on third base. The play was made. This ball gets by him. A lot of bad things are going to happen. Caught it in the heel of the glove and held on. And on super shot, Trevino slides in with the six run. Here's Torres, first and second, two outs. Outside, 1 0. Oh. And the pitch. One and one. So the Yankees stem the tide right here. The Royals had scored two runs to cut the lead in half, and the Yankees, boom, got back those two right now in the bottom of the fourth inning at 6 2. The Yankees lead. One and two on Glaber Torres. Nestor Cortez obviously loving the support. He's trying to pick up his ninth win of the year and the Yankees 69th win of the year. One two. Did he go? Yes he did. Torres is down and a good job by Mills, but the Yankees score two on one hit and two big errors. We go to the fifth. Maybe what he's done the last 25 games and then Trace Thompson, his brother won the NBA title. He said, well, let me get to it. And he has been very, very hot as well. Trace and Clay. That must be some Thanksgiving. They just brag about what they do. He's, he's on all the highlights late, lately. He's all over the place playing well. The 0-2, one and two. Hester breaking out the little hesitation. He's been kind of traditional today. Now taking it into the fifth inning, his 80th pitch coming. Hit sharply to short. Connor Falefa, the throw, and they just get Merrifield for the first up. Hey, tonight, NYCFC is north of the border for a big Eastern Conference matchup with CF Montreal. Coverage begins at 7 on Yes, New York's most watched sports network, and your home for NYCFC and the first place New York Yankees. There's Bobby Witt Jr. 22 years old. Made his Major League debut on opening day this year. And he is the number three prospect on Baseball America's top 100 list going into the season. Adley Rushman, the catcher for the Orioles, was first. Julio Rodriguez, 
of the Mariners was second. I had a chance to talk to Bobby Witt Jr. in Kansas City early on this year. And boy, when you just have a conversation with him, you know he comes from good upbringing. He's been around this game his whole life. And not only do the Royals have a really good player, they have a really good kid in their clubhouse to be a leader. See, I talked to Bobby Witt Jr. as well. He doesn't like either of you. Uh, you were four for eight <laughs> against his dad, Flash. And Paul, you hit 390 with three home runs and 43 plate appearances against Bobby Witt Sr. So Bobby Witt Jr. wants no part of either of you. Be a shoe in for the rookie of the year if it went for Julio Rodriguez out in Seattle. I mean, he's a one of the stars of the game. There's no doubt about it. 20 stolen bases so far this year. I mean, this unbelievable prospect coming up started at third, went back to short, which he played in the minor leagues. But I was anxious to watch him play. I mean, today we see him as a hitter, but I'm anxious to see him out in the field as an everyday player. Paul, do you remember having that kind of success against Bobby Witt Senior? I, you know what, there were times. Yeah, he was a uh, he was a good at bat for me. I saw the ball well from him. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just the way things go. Some pitchers, you see the ball well, you hit the ball well, and everything you hit falls in as hits. And Bobby Witt was a, a guy that I pretty much paralleled our the same years. Uh, he played what 16 years, I think. Pretty much the same time, same era that I played. Swing and a miss. Bobby Witt Jr. has struck out three times today against Cortez. Yeah, and I caught Bobby Witt, and I, I'm just thinking about the matchup with you, Paul. He loved to throw fastballs away. You see, that's mm -hmm. a fastball away from Nestor Cortez. So I know trying to get you out all those years, you loved the ball out over the plate. So it was a matchup built right in for you. Salvador Perez takes a strike from Cortez. Two outs here in the fifth. Fly ball right field. Carpenter is there. And a good one, two, three inning for Nesta Cortez. We're halfway. So Donaldson struck out, then lined out sharply to Lopez in the third. Donaldson seven for his last 31. And his average at 221 now. Another nice crowd here at the stadium on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. One and oh. Coming into today, the Yankees averaged five point three two runs per game. That's best in the American League. They've allowed three point three one runs. Per game, that second in Major League Baseball to the Dodgers, who allow 3.26, and a run differential of plus 203, the best in the majors. Everything is clicking for the Yankee offense, and a big part of that is the home run. There's no getting around it, and they don't want you to get around it. That's how they win games, and they think that's how you will win games in the postseason as well. You very rarely see Aaron Boone, I wouldn't say lose his cool, but snap at anybody in any of his press availability. But the other day when somebody said, do you think there are too many home run hitters on your team? And he just said, that's fake news. That right there is fake news. He said, we have savages in the box. They can hit anything, and we happen to hit home runs. That's how we score a lot of runs. And one of the great misrepresentations is that you don't hit home runs in the postseason against good pitching but if you look at the statistics the percentage of runs scored on home runs is higher in the postseason than it is during the regular season so home runs work in the postseason as well 
Yeah, it's a new age. There's no doubt about it. I mean, even the greatest pitchers. Uh, you look at uh, like a game plan. You see Josh Donaldson go down. Good pitch down and away. But one of the elite pitchers in the league. How do you score runs? Garrett Cole, for instance. He gives up some home runs. I mean, you cannot string together three, four, five hits off some of the better pitchers in the league. And like I said, this day and age, with the home run and the power to most hitters, that's the way you score a lot of runs. You think flash? Well, I will say catcher, this though. Right? I will say this though, Paul. I, I think if you have guys in your lineup like now Ben and IKF, mm -hmm. who put the ball in play. And we've seen this against the Royals who are, are not a good team. They're not going to be fighting for a playoff spot. But you press put pressure on a team defensively, you know, despite putting some balls in play. So I think this Yankee lineup is a perfect combination of guys who drive the ball, drive the ball out of the ballpark, and you also have a couple that like to put the ball in play, which makes life a lot tougher for a defense and a pitching staff. Now I think that when you run into trouble in the postseason, and the Yankees have been this in the past is when you hit a lot of home runs but you also strike out a lot and you take a look at the Houston Astros and why they're tough in the postseason they hit home runs but they put the ball in play and do not strike out as much they have bat to ball skills and that's why the Yankees went out and got Ben Intendi. he has bat to ball skills he's not a home run hitter. yeah the immediate hitter I think about is Michael Brantley with the Houston Astros mm -hmm. who just get, wears you down with his at bats putting balls in play doesn't have a ton of power but he's a, a perfect complement in the middle of their lineup when he's healthy. Raldis Chapman getting ready in the Yankee bullpen. 1 2 on Carpenter. He's over one with a walk today. Matt has four hits in his last 26 at bats. Just missed. Good take. Two and two. Well, I tell you what, the Scatum report on Jordan Baker behind the plate has been extremely accurate today. Close pitches all going to the hitters to this point. Two two. Swing and a miss. Carpenter down on strikes. Well, fans, catch an all new episode of the Curtain Call podcast as John J. Filippelli and special guest host Justin Shackle discuss the upcoming trade deadline and what additional moves the Yankees might make to bolster their run for a championship. Listen and subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. It's a really good podcast. People that do listen to it love it. We get a lot of good information. So, Justin and Flip. We'll entertain you on the podcast. One and zero on Hicks. Hicks wrapped into a double play with the bases loaded in the first inning, and then fouled out to third base. That was in the fourth. That was a strike. And one and one. They're all filing in. Judge isn't up this inning, so they're all filing into the concession stands. Right back to Mills. Nice play. Underhands it to Pasquantino. And Mills works a 1 2 3 inning. We go to the six. Montefiore Einstein and the Yankees lead the Royals 6 to 2. That's going to do it for Nesta Cortez, and they bring on Araldis Chapman to pitch the sixth inning. And he's pitched well his last couple times out. Last time we saw him against the Royals, I mean, throwing BBs and really making quick work of the Royals. I hope he goes back to sticking and leaning on that fastball. He was at 102 last time you were talking about Michael, but he just dominated with his fastball. 
and didn't really get away from it. Awkward oh. finish there. Chapman. Obviously a relief pitcher coming in you have to establish that hole that your front foot is going to land in a little awkward finish there it looks like he's okay. And a flash I forgot to ask you or started when Nestor was in the game when he does that uh, you know sidearm pitches and some of the hesitation moves. Those things that you need to know as a catcher, or you just know what pitch is coming? No, I think you're always on guard, Paul, and, and I think about Mike Mussina when he used to drop down. You know, you used to almost take it as a personal challenge when you're behind the plate. I'm not going to let you drop down and sweep that breaking ball and be able to block it. So I think at this point, you know, the, the catchers for the Yankees know that there's possibilities that he's going to drop down at any time, and they're ready for it. Mm hmm. The one two strike three a hundred miles an hour Dozier down looking. Well the more that happens the more confidence you get and all of a sudden Chapman I think believes in his fastball again which is a very good sign for Aaron Boone and the Yankees because he is dominant. When you look at his career when he overpowers hitters with his fastball. So one away and here is Pasquantino we're in the sixth inning eight he's lead by four six to two. Trying to take their third straight against Kansas City. You know what Paul I think at this point in Araldis Chapman's career he's he's really got to do a good job of recognizing what he has in the bullpen before he comes out right I mean back in the day. It was 100 plus with a nasty slider. Now it's like, okay, do I have my good fastball today? Yes, I do. 99 miles an hour right there. I can go with that. And there are relief pitchers that I've worked. Jeff Reardon was a guy who could never recognize what he had in the bullpen. He needed the catcher to tell him, hey, you got a good fastball today, or hey, let's go to your breaking ball a little bit more. So I guess my point is Chapman's got to figure it out in the pen. Do I have a good fastball? If I do, let's ride it out this inning. Mm hmm. One and two. There's a slider. Now when he has them both working, then he's close to one hit him. Well, when you throw 99 miles an hour and you dot it down and away to a left-handed hitter, I mean that slider off of that is going to be devastating. It'll be an interesting pitch here, one and two. Looped into left field. Benintendi is there to make the play to retire Pasquantino for the second out. Again, went back to the fastball, got a lot of the plate, but it was 101 miles an hour, and it's an out. And I think sometimes Chapman almost gets spooked when his fastball gets hit, and, and then he goes away from it. I mean, outs are outs, whether they're strikeouts, whether they're jam shots, continue to throw strikes, especially with a four run lead against a team offensively that doesn't have a lot of pop. Michael A. Taylor. Takes pitch low and inside 1 0. Taylor is 1 for 2. Fly ball to right, a single to center, came around to score in the fourth inning. You, know, you might wonder, well, why take Cortez out after five innings? He, he, he gave up just two runs. Well, they're managing innings now. You know, he is pitching more innings in the big leagues than he's ever pitched before. And they're just trying to manage it. They don't want to blow him out and get him to 200 innings. And if you've got a four run lead and you've got a rested bullpen, give him four innings off. Two and one. I think also recognizing that Nestor had to work today, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy five innings. So Aaron Boone recognizing that good day to get him out of there and get your bullpen some work. Now Nestor says this year he feels great compared to last year. He's at 106 and two third innings right now a season high in his pro career 115 in 2018. That with that's with Trenton and Scranton but in his big league career 
He's never had these numbers. Just add a couple more innings to that 2018 total. He went to winter ball and threw an additional 47 in the Dominican Republic. So that gives you 162 in 2018, but that's four years ago. He's never thrown that in the big leagues, and that's a different sort of pitch. 2-2. Two -two. Strike three. Taylor down looking. Another good inning for Aldis Chapman as he retires. The Royals in order. 1-2-3. We go to the bottom of the set. This will be his 34th game. You see his numbers. Too many walks, but 34 strikeouts in 30 innings. Well, you mentioned that Michael walks, and there's been a lot of them in that Kansas City bullpen. I mentioned it last night. They are on pace to set a franchise record with walks from their bullpen this year. Stomont, 28 years old, fourth big league season. Missed three weeks this year with a neck strain. Came back just before the All-Star break. You'll like this, Paul. He says he's he's a planner, a planner. Each day lays out his clothes for the next day in advance. Keeps everything extremely organized in his locker. That's pretty much what Neville does for you. <laughs> I was just going to say my wife is, is all on board. That's just not the way I live. It, it can, when things are planned out that neat, I, I, it confuses me. It just doesn't work. One zero to IKF upstairs. You a planner, John? I plan for like the next half hour. That's about <laughs> it. Yes. And then we then we evaluate from there, right, Paul? <laughs> half hour exactly. to half hour. I've got guys that like make up their schedules. You know, golf buddies. You know, they want to play golf. Uh, you know, three Tuesdays from. I'm like, how in the world do I know what I'm doing in three weeks on Tuesday at 11 in the morning? But they they schedule these things so. Yeah, I, I, I can't go past today. Today, we get through today, and you look look forward to a good one tomorrow. Wow, both of you, wow. I guess you go hole to hole on the golf course. <laughs> well, you have to think about what we did for a living. It was, okay, what time do I need to get to the stadium, right, Paul? Then what time do you need to get to the batting cage? What time is batting practice? It's all just steps along the way, Michael. Mm -hmm. But in essence, for six months of the season, your life was planned. You knew exactly what you're doing on September 11th, September 15th. Yes, but we didn't look at September 11th or September 15th. We looked in half hour intervals. <laughs> <laughs> we went from at bat to at bat. You know, you, sometimes that could take 10 minutes. Sometimes it could take a half an hour. My wife always says, who would take care of you if I didn't? I said, well, I had Robbie Kakuza. He took care of everything. So I can't help it. Balk. A balk. IKF will take second. Salmon doesn't know what he did. Neither does Matheny. He's going to want some kind of explanation. Step off. The umpires are going to talk about it now. Because that foot never left the rubber, and then he slid it off the rubber. I think that's what they saw. And now they're going to get together and see. Maybe I don't. I don't think they'll overturn it, but at least they're talking about it. Well, it's kind of spin move there, but it's, it, it, it's in front where most most pitchers, uh, you know, just spin and turn around. That that he just kind of spun and just fired it over there like a second baseman. So runner at second now after the balk and Trevino at the plate. He scored two runs today. One for two. Pitch is high. Singled and, and reached on a fielder's choice.
2-0. I don't think this is what you really want out of a reliever to come out of the bullpen. Four straight, a balk, two straight balls. <laughs> I don't know if that's what Mike Matheny was looking for, Paul. <laughs> Not the game plan. And then you got Aaron Judge lurking. He's in the hole right now. On deck is LeMayu. There's a strike, two and one. As you look at Aaron Judge, I loved his on field interview last night after the game talking about the sandwich and who hits before him and who hits after him. And as he continues to go through this streak, that is going to become much more important. The guys get on base before him, so they have to pitch to him. And the guy behind him is still productive where they have to pitch to him. And obviously, getting Big G back in the lineup is another force that only helps Aaron Judge. All right, so Paul, when you were part of the sandwich, did you like being the meat or the bread? What did you prefer? Protection or did you want to be protection? Oh, I, you know, as a hitter, you just loved a great guy behind you because you knew you were going to be pitched to. And Bernie was a switch hitter, so most of the time, uh, you know, I, I, if I'm a pitcher, I'd much rather try to get me out than Bernie Williams. He was a good hitter. You know, it's funny you mention that because I think that Bernie got lost because he was so quiet and wasn't really demonstrative with his fame and his success. But if you're watching the Jeter documentary on ESPN, I mean, this guy, all he did was get big hits in the postseason. Mm -hmm. He was some player. View from above. Love that shot. 2-2. Strike three, Trevino knew it, he's down looking. So here is LeMahieu, started off the first inning with a home run into the Yankee bullpen, then a fly ball to right. And then an RBI single to left center. So a couple of ribbies hit his 10th home run. Well, you give DJ LeMayu a lot of credit for picking it up and getting multi-hit games, but we just talked, Paul, about the lineup. This could be the best spot to hit in the American League in front of Aaron Judge because you know from the pitcher-catcher standpoint they have to come right at you here with first base open. You're going to get pitches to hit because Judge is on the on-deck circle. Flash, to your point, I always thought that, you know, if there was not, you know, somebody wasn't hot behind you, this was probably the hardest at bat in baseball, not knowing in the back of your mind if they're going to go after you uh, with first base open. With Aaron Judge on deck, they're going after you. Runner goes. Throw to third, and it goes into left field. Pound of Alefa gets up. He will score, and it's 7-2 Yanks. So a stolen base in an E2. That's one thing that Kiner Falefa has added to this lineup. And he does. That's his 15th stolen base of the year and a scored run. And again, the reason I love stolen bases and, and putting runners in motion, it puts pressure on the defense. Here's one of the best catchers in baseball. Still, an errant throw, you just steal a run. about the difference with this team putting some balls in play and you're right the running game picked their spots a lot better this year than they have in the past got a double clutch on that swing and fouled it away Soft ground ball is short. Garcia takes his time. Two away. And that'll bring up Judge. Look at him, Tim. Look at him. Yes, he's number one in a lot of categories right now. You are correct. Two hits, a home run, another home run in the second inning, his 42nd of the year, and his 200th in his career. 
and he's the second player to hit his 200th career home run with the Yankees against the Royals and the other one is Paul O'Neill against Tim Belcher in 1998. That's funny I was thinking it had to be against Tim Belcher. <laughs> yeah, a lot of homers against him. Over the glove of Perez 1 and 0. Statcast 3D brought to you by Google Cloud. That's what uh, Judge has done in comparison to the LA Angels. Angels have 14 homers. Judge has 13. The Angels have the fewest in the majors this month. Now that's a team. Judge is just one guy. <laughs> you know, Michael, we always talk about that looks like a, a bowl of spaghetti. Well, that's not a half order. <laughs> when you do Judge's home runs, you're getting you're getting the full order. And it's probably al dente too. It really puts a, a dent in the, in the wall. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, that Toyota sign still has a dent in it. 2 0 count to Judge. Two for two with a walk. Two and one. Seven two Yankees bottom of the sixth inning one run in two outs nobody on three infielders on the left side Lopez hugging the line at third. Two and two. Flash I don't know that's one of the better curveballs I've seen I mean that was a really really good curveball you see Aaron Judge just kind of locks up. Is also what I think you can expect moving forward. A lot of off speed pitches and fastball counts to Aaron Judge. Three and two. Well, that's the difference you see in Aaron Judge from the first year, his rookie year, which he had a phenomenal year, but that's the kind of pitch that he would swing at. So much more discipline now. Doesn't. You know, offered a lot of those balls outside the strike zone. Still three and two. This is one of those situations where he just threw back to back curveballs. Aaron Judge has spoiled a good pitch and. I'm sure there's a part of him is thinking I can sneak a fastball by him. He's got to be looking off speed. I can sneak it by him away and that just plays right into the strength of Aaron Judge. Three two upstairs and Judge works another walk. Well, he tried to sneak it by him but he tried to sneak it into the stands too by throwing it way over his head. Mike Messina Matheny heading to the mound. So Amir Garrett is going to come in to face his former teammate Andrew Benintendi. Yankees up by five with a run on first and two outs. Get too emotional, so that's why they had John. Do it. <laughs> I, I noticed you introduced David Cohn. I, I didn't did. get emotional about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Here is Amir Garrett up there. I, hear, I, I see it already. <laughs> so Garrett against Benintendi with a runner on first. Now you might know Amir Garrett even if you're not a baseball fan he played basketball for St. John's. Reds allowed him to play at St. John's. While he was uh, preparing to play in the minor leagues. Played two seasons at St. John's pitch inside. Twenty five starts fifty five games he averaged six point two points per game. I do remember one thing Michael he, he threw a pitch in Cincinnati and did not wait for the for the team to follow he just ran towards the dugout he wanted the whole dugout I mean that was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen you know usually a pitcher makes a purpose pitch and then they wait to see if something's happened he just dropped his glove and went running to the Reds dugout <laughs> or the Pittsburgh dugout there's a strike. He is from Henderson Nevada and he actually played 
with the top guys in Nevada, Bryce Harper and Joey Gallo in high school in Henderson. And he walks his former teammate, Andrew Benintendi. So Benintendi, we've told you about it. He has a really good on-base percentage, and that continues two more walks today. He will take a walk and pass the baton, and it's passed now to Glaber Torres. Such a good game for Benintendi because the more at-bats he gets, the more comfortable he's going to be in the surroundings of being with the Yankees and just, you know, he's going to figure out his role. And I think the most important thing uh, of him coming over is he does not have to change. He doesn't have to hit more home runs. He doesn't have to do anything other than continue to do what he's done. And, and that's a big, big thing because when you're traded, and then they expect you to do something a little bit different or more than you, you've been doing. Then you start to try to change and they, it, it can really backfire on you. First and second, two men out, one run in, three walks for the Yankees. That's the offense in this inning. A walk, a balk, a stolen base, and an E2. That's how they scored the run. And that was by Kiner Falefa. And the 0-2. One two pitch, swing and a miss. Torres down on strikes. One run, no hits, one error, and two men left. We go to the seventh. Yankees up by five. For third Yankee pitcher, Nestor Cortez won five. Araldus Chapman pitched the one, two, three, six with two strikeouts. And now Clark Schmidt comes on. And he could get another Clark Schmidt type save with three innings. Yeah, three innings his last time against Baltimore picked up a save on what I remember from that game, a really good slider from Clark Schmidt. So Obviously, a guy went down to the minor leagues, has been stretched out as a starting pitcher, so can give the Yankees and Aaron Boone multiple innings. Here is MJ Melendez to start it off. 0 for 1 with a walk. It'll be the bottom third of the Royals order as they're down by 5. You know, Paul, you mentioned Robbie Kakuza, who essentially is the keeper of the pinstripes. He runs the Yankee clubhouse. He hands out the uniforms and the numbers when a player is, is acquired. And there's, there's a lot of gravitas to that because you're handling Yankee history. And he, he has done something. And I think about it this series because in the booth next to us is Rex Hudlin. Rex Hudler was a former number one draft pick for the New York Yankees. And what Robbie has done since the new stadium opened is anybody who has ever played a game for the Yankees signs the wall, which is in front of the clubhouse. This is not for fans or anything like that. This is for the people that play for the Yankees and they can see the history of the team. And th there's a shot of it. Now, around the interlocking NY, the people that sign there, those are all Hall of Famers. But Rex Hudler signed his autograph, and he was so proud to have done it. And it means a lot. And I, I just think it's it's a wonderful thing, there's Rex, that Robbie has done. And if you walk by that wall, you kind of get chills. You see Whitey Ford's name and uh, Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. It, it's kind of awesome. Mm. I agree, Michael. And it, that's just not like a painted wall. It's I don't know if it's leather or whatever it is, but it is a, a beautiful piece walking into the Yankee clubhouse. So you've signed it John you've signed it it's uh, it must be an honor right. Well it's definitely an honor and when you know Robbie asked me I didn't 
actually know what he was talking about because it's in a place that we can't get to mm -hmm. as a member of the media. And he, he brings you back there to sign it and lets you know exactly where he thinks you should sign it, which is perfect. And, yeah, it's quite an honor. Remember my first spring training with the Red Sox, or Red Sox, with the Yankees in 03. And I was a veteran player at that point. But, Paul, I just expected to have an elevated number, right? I mean, because so many numbers have been retired. And when I saw number 17 uh, hanging in my locker, I, I thanked Robbie and I thanked Lou Kukuza. Because that's a, that, that meant a lot to me, that they, they thought they would give me a respectable <laughs> number. And, you know, I came into the uh, my first big league camp in Boston with number 62, and I kind of expected the the same thing with uh, the Yankees. So I was always appreciative of giving me a respectable number. And there was a big story in the post about that wall uh, about two weeks back. And we also have to give credit. I know this guy has helped you a lot, Paul, is Joe Lee, who has worked in the clubhouse forever. He and Robbie kind of came up with the idea, let's do something with this wall. And any Yankee that becomes a Yankee and walks through those doors, he sees the history of the team right in front of him. Everybody signs in like a silver marker against the midnight blue leather background. And then you start judging signatures. And, and again, it's still Mo. Mariano just, yeah. you know, that's <laughs> that's the artwork. Again, a CBS receded bat right over here. Very long at bat. <laughs> Two and two on Melendez. And Schmidt wins the battle. As Melendez down on strikes. Well, it's a slider you're talking about, Flash. Once you get ahead in the count, it's amazing what major league hitters will go after. Good slider down and in. I inadvertently said DiMaggio and Mantis on the wall. Obviously, they, they didn't because they weren't around to do it. But anybody that has walked through these walls, that has played for the Yankees at any time, even if they're on the other team, Robbie gets them to sign that wall. It's like to the hallway and right off of that office is where I used to sit. And there's the autograph. <laughs> Legible everything. Straight out of Fordham. Michael K. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. It's not on the wall, though, as it shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was saying, there's an office, and it's Robbie's office. It's very large. A lot of times uh, people will hang out in there. And I, I, I remember many days I would just sit in there on the couch and listen to Yogi Berra and his stories. And it just, he was so genuine at just telling things the way it is. And it, 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 I, I used to just kind of pinch myself at times and think, I'm sitting here talking to Yogi Berra. And, and then you walk out and you put some of the other names to faces and Whitey Forbes would walk by. And it's just, no other organization has the history that the Euro New York Yankees do. Base hit for Garcia. So he has five hits now in these two games. His first five hits in the big leagues. You know, one uh, other thing no, about the wait, wall that we should wait. say. Well, what's this? You got to stop, Mike. I mean, look who's around you. You got Mattingly, Babe Ruth. Yeah. Come on. That's right. And Johnny Mize. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's large. Hey, they asked. I signed. I didn't, I didn't ask for placement. <laughs> And that's in the Yankee Museum, which is down the right field line. And it's the coolest thing to have um, a statue of Don Larson throwing the final pitch of the perfect game in 1956. And they have a statue of Yogi in a crouch position. And then they're, they're separated by 60 feet, 6 inches. And in that arc of, of the way the pitch went, there's all these balls signed by people connected with the Yankees all the way to Yogi. You know, one more thing about the wall. If you sign the wall and then you become a Hall of Famer, you sign it again within the interlocking NY as a Hall of Famer. So you could have two names, two of the same names on the board, but one after they became a Hall of Famer. Nice. So He's C. always C. got up as one. How about oh, CC yeah, I mean, Sabathia might be able to do that eventually, right? Yeah. He's a Hall of Fame. He'll resign it. 
Lined right at Donaldson, two way. You would think that Mariano and Jeet have signed. Yes. Yes. Yep. yes. You're right. That was a bullet right at Donaldson for the second out. Now Ichiro is signed. He's going to end up in the Hall of Fame, so he'll sign again. Beltron might end up in the Hall of Fame. He'll sign again. Here's Merrifield. And there's a strike. Now has Ichiro been inducted to the Hall of Fame in, in, in Japanese Hall of Fame? I'm not sure, Paul. Yeah, because he will go into both, I assume, right? You would think. Popped up. Who's going to get it? LeMayu wants it. He'll take it, and that's the end of the inning. No runs, a hit, no errors, and one man left on base at the end of six and a half. It's time for the seventh inning stretch. Yankees lead the Royals 7 2, but we'll stay right here as we honor America in the Bronx. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. Will you please rise and remove your caps? Today, the Yankees are honoring as their veteran of the game, United States Navy Seaman First Class Harry McLaughlin from the Bronx who served in World War II. The Yankees say thank you for your sacrifice and service to our nation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Merrill's rendition of God Bless America. Joel Piams, his 26th outing. You see his numbers. And he will face Donaldson, Carpenter, and Hicks. And there's a strike to Donaldson. Donaldson 0 for 3, two strikeouts and a hard line drive to Lopez at third. Piamps uh, split time last year between Toronto and KC. Fourth big league season, 28 years old. Trying to keep it right here at 7 2, bottom of the seven. All right, so we did some research for you, Paul. Ichiro is not right. in the Japanese Hall of Fame because they don't start his clock until after he retired from MLB. And Ichiro actually retired in 2019, so he played for a while. Mm -hmm. And Ichiro and CC are actually two potential first ballot guys for the class of 2025. 
Swing and a miss. Donaldson strikes out for the third time today. Paul, you seen the same thing that you talked about yesterday with Josh? Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't look like anything's in sync. It just looks like he's kind of searching for that comfort. Big leg kick, but then again, uh, everything kind of breaks down at the end, which to me, you know, you just don't have your good balance. You see it all just kind of break down out to the front side a little bit. And it, it doesn't take much with a big leg kick like that to get out of balance. I mean, it takes a lot of talent just to, to be able to pick up the baseball with that leg up. And right now, it doesn't look like he's doing that. Matt Carpenter swings and misses. He's 0 for 2 with a walk. Crowd of 44,081 here at the stadium. Paul Donaldson has that look on his face that you can tell this is starting to get old, right? I mean, three strikeouts, a hard line drive to third base, nothing to show for it, and you're standing in the dugout, and you don't know whether to, well, you knew whether to explode or not, but the rest of us tried to keep it together, and it looks like he's trying to keep it together, but frustration starting to settle in. I mean, this is a former MVP, so he has seen success, and... This is not the season. Now, he's had a great season defensively, but this is not the season he thought he was going to have offensively. Yep, there's the look on the face. You can tell. High drive, right field. Melendez back, turning, looking. See ya. A home run for Carpenter. His 15th of the year. It's 8 2 Yanks. A uh, couple of the stories you've seen with the Yankees is Carpenter, Cortez, Judge. But I tell you what, I mean, yesterday, pinch hit. He's going to get his in bats. Aaron Boone has no choice. He just continues to hit home runs his 15th of the year, as you said, Michael. Just so quick to the baseball. Well, he has the ability to cover the inner half, and he has the ability to get the baseball in the air. And obviously, those two qualities are going to lead to a lot of home runs. Number 15 for a guy who went back to the drawing board and is being rewarded with a big season. You look at the super shot and again no wasted movement ball bat goes straight to the baseball slight uppercut just a perfect swing for a lefty in Yankee Stadium. One and one on Hicks. Matt Carpenter since May 26 that's when he started he's third tied with Corey Seager for the most home runs. Two and two on Hicks. Hicks is 0 for 3. Nice, neat scorecard. Swing and a miss. Hicks down on strikes, two away. You know, Michael, that's the old school, the scorecard, and I know how good you are at it. I mean, it's not going to be long for the people be doing it on their iPads and then printing it when they go home. You know, everything changes a little bit, but it's fun to see the backward Ks, the frontward Ks, just all the good stuff that 
reminds you all the way back to Little League and the scorecard. They do have programs on the iPad to do it. I, I just still feel more comfortable doing it by pen. Mm -hmm. Old school. You're yeah. old school. That's what I am. Yep. 1-0. and IKF has scored two today. Also has a stolen base. Hey, stream Yankees baseball on the S app presented by Miller Lite. Grounded to third, charging Lopez. And that'll do it here in the seventh. But Matt Carpenter, been slumping a little bit. Four for his last 27, but then he connects for his 15th home run of the year. 30. So Carpenter hits a home run, gets the rest of the day off. The Hyundai scoreboard, Yankees eight and the Royals two. We go to the eighth inning. Clark Schmidt still in there. He'll deal to Bobby Witt Jr. The pitch up and in and past Trevino, 1-0. Michael, we've talked about a lot of players that the Yankees might want to add. You, you've got to subtract, too. I mean, and you, you, reality is reality. Will Joey Gallo be here past Tuesday as a Yankee? Well, you know what? It's funny. Um, Lindsey Adler of The Athletic did a really in-depth story on Joey Gallo and spoke to Joey Gallo. And Joey Gallo, amazingly enough, I've never seen this, was talking in past tense as if he's gone already. Now everybody assumes that he he, end, he will end up being traded, but he was talking about how he'll always regret it uh, that he didn't perform here. And every time he sees the Yankee logo, he's going to think about how he didn't perform here. And I mean, he was straight up honest. You read the story, John? Yeah, I mean, he was incredibly honest. But again, surprising that a player would basically talk like he was going to be gone right I mean you usually wait for a transaction to happen and, and react to it but it uh, has been a struggle from last year into this year for Joey Gallo and he recognizes that it has been a struggle for Bobby Witt so he has the uh, old golden sombrero he has struck out four times after missing five games with a hamstring issue this is his first game back four strikeouts Pitch to Perez outside, 1 0. Now, Jack Curry back in the studio, and really for Yankee news, he's the guy to follow. He just tweeted out two minutes ago, Adam Duvall is done for the year after a wrist injury. Wouldn't be surprised to see the Braves take a flyer on Joey Gallo. Duvall's stats were slightly better than Gallo, and Gallo is a better defender. So Duvall hit 213 with 12 home runs. Gallo's hitting 159 with 12 home runs. They both strike out a lot as well. It's funny because there were a lot of rumors last year you know before the Yankees got Joey Gallo that the Atlanta Braves wanted Gallo also so they've been interested in him and that's a, a great pickup by Jack. 2 2. And although Joey has struggled here since coming here he's been here about a, a full season now back to the trade deadline last year. Everything you hear is that there is a market for him there are teams that believe that out of New York he can be the power hitter that he was with the Texas Rangers. And Paris swings and misses. Two way. Well, when Michael King went down with that injury, I remember in the studio saying there it's going to be audition time for a lot of the guys coming out of the bullpen. Clark Schmidt is no different. If he can prove to Aaron Boone and his staff that he can throw strikes and be reliable coming out of the pen. He's got the stuff to do it. A little backup slider right there and can give you multiple innings. You start thinking coming down the stretch and into the postseason as that slider gets away. What your bullpen's going to look like, Paul, right? Because we don't really know right now 
at this point the end of July what that pen is going to look like at the beginning of October. Yeah I, I agree I think that Chapman has been really good the last two or three times out and uh, you know that's been worrisome for the Yankees is he going to get back so the last three appearances by Chapman have been good and it's just uh, the wild card to me is Loisaga and uh, I agree with you Flash I've seen it this year with his his two seamer kind of running now instead of going straight down I think that he it can be the same it's not velocity I mean yep. he arguably was the best reliever in baseball last year so uh, if you could get him back healthy keep Clay Holmes throwing the way he has all year uh, I think your bullpen is going to be fine. Fly ball left center who's going to get it Hicks calls off Ben and and Schmidt works a one two three inning and we go to the bottom of the eighth Yankees are up by six two. It'll be Trevino, LeMahieu, and Judge against Piamps. Now, this game started, I, I believe the first pitch was thrown at 208. Usually games at Yankee Stadium start at 108, and on Sundays, 135. And because of a later start, and that pitch was inside after Schmidt has gone inside twice, I'm just wondering, Paul and John, are shadows affecting it, and is it making tough now? Is it tough for the hitters it's getting to that point yeah. right Paul yeah I always uh, I mean hated this time of day you, you almost would look up there on the on deck circle if there was a cloud close that you could kind of stall to get some shade but it just uh, it doesn't make it ideal I, I think at this point it's still OK because uh, the pitcher is still in the sunlight but as it creeps out there and it goes fast it becomes hard to pick up the baseball and you know flash even as a catcher uh, you get tough shadows it's, it, it's got to be tough to pick up the seams and follow the ball even to catch other than hit. Right? Yeah, yeah it is except that you know we would know what was coming so you kind of would figure out where the mistake mm -hmm. was going to be on a slider away or a fastball in so uh, you know LeMay wears the sunglasses on all the day games continuing to wear it now I know hitters told me they felt like that helped them kind of alleviate some of the shadows. And that's one thing and I've, I've talked many times about it is that I, 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 I couldn't wear them and I used to always ask Bernie because he wore sunglasses to hit and it just seemed like it kind of messed with my depth perception. I, I just did not pick up the ball as well. Uh, that was not an option for me. You ever hit with shades flash. I did and you know the one thing that I, I always had a problem sometimes I didn't turn my my eyes to the pitcher. I was kind of looking more towards second base so I mm -hmm. felt like. When I had sunglasses on, it forced me with that nose piece that you really had to get your, your right. eyes on the pitcher. So I tried it a few times, but, you know, depending on uh, the temperature of the day, right? If I'm feeling like Josh Donaldson right now, I would try anything. <laughs> <laughs> now, Michael, take yourself back to Little League in the Bronx, man, and you had your little flip shades. Did you wear them to the plate or only in the outfield? I couldn't hit whether I wore binoculars or not, so it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well you know what sometimes if you're honest with yourself it just makes things a lot easier you know that right around Little League I started to think you know what broadcasting might be a good route. <laughs> <laughs> Three one. There's a strike. Three and two. Flash I don't know if you know but years back when the uh, last old timers day I uh, I played in. Michael and I had a catch out there. I was very impressed. He was snagging him, throwing him like he had done it many times before. See that? See that, John? Well, I was actually thinking. You, you can text me later on when when Michael's not around and let me know if that really was true or you were <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Billy, I, I was pleasantly impressed. I mean, surprisingly, almost. But uh, it was it looked very natural to him. See that's the key that he's really not articulating well. He expected nothing and got <laughs> the got minimum got and something. thought wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tell you what the, the first ball I threw to him was really soft. I didn't want any between the eyes but when he, he started grabbing leather on him I'm like all right he, he's all right he can do this. Here's Aaron Judge look at the last 12 games hitting 500 that's good by the way 22 for 44. And 11 of the 22 have left the yard. 25 runs batted in. One and zero. 
So he's two for two with two walks today. He doesn't chase, so he might get walked a lot more than he usually does because I think people are just going to avoid him. There's a strike. Remember when Barry Bonds was unstoppable? I mean, Buck Showalter walked him with the bases loaded. That's quite a combo right there, huh? One one. Two and one. You know, it's funny, Flash, is earlier in the broadcast you said you were, you know, so thankful to Robbie Kakuza for getting a respectable number. And now that Aaron Judge has broke out with the 99, yeah. I mean, you can go all over the map now and be cool, right? You got that right. The 2-1. Two, 2-2. Two and two. Three and two. So LeMayhew is at first, held there by Pasquantino. One man out. We're in the bottom of the eighth inning. 8 2, Yankees lead. Judge already has a home run today. His 200th career home run, 42nd of this season. And the pitch. High fly ball. Right field, Melendez comes in and puts it away for the second out. Well, fans, stay tuned after the final out for the WB Mason Yankees post game and get highlights, analysis, and complete player reaction from today's game with the Royals. Plus, Aaron Boone on the manager's report. How you guys doing? And Judge doing fine, despite making. And out for the first time today. So two way, and that brings up Ben Intendi. Outside one and oh. Ben Intendi walked twice, sack fly. So he's 0 for one. Two and oh. And the pitch. Outside three and oh. And you can tell him Ben and Certainly fits the Yankee ethos. He is he's not going to chase and he's got a good eye and he'll take the walk. Three out. Ball four. So he walks for the third time today. That moves LeMahieu to second and brings up Torres. And there's the strike. RBI double to right center in the first inning for Torres. And a ground out to short, two strikeouts. Batting cleanup today. Pitch high. Still no baseball activity for Giancarlo Stanton. 
Told you that uh, Severino's about to start throwing again, so that's a good sign. But without Stan, different lineup every day for Aaron Boone as he tries to piece it together today. Torres batting cleanup. There's Giancarlo, he's been with the team. But uh, they're shutting it down for a while while he uh, heals. And Boone did say that when Stan's back, he's going to use him the way he's been using him. He's not going to avoid using him in the outfield. The Yankees have so many more options when Stanton's able to play right field. Opens up a lot of things for Boone to do with the lineup. One, two, upstairs. Two on, two outs, 2-2 two, two count, 8-2 Yankee lead. Piamps deals. Really quick stat from Katie Sharp, who does a great job on, on Twitter. So Matt Carpenter just hit his 15th home run last inning. Well, these are the three Yankees that have had 15 or more home runs and 30 or more ribbies in their first 40 games as a Yankee within a single season. Matt Carpenter, Roger Maris in 1960, and Babe Ruth in 1920. <laughs> Pretty good club there, Matt. Runners go, 3-2, swing and a miss. And Torres down on strikes. No runs a hit, and two men left. We go to the ninth, Yankees up by six. So Pasquintino against Schmidt. Schmidt gets these three outs, he gets himself another save. And that's how it works, three innings of decent baseball. You can get a save, you don't have to uh, have the time run on deck or anything like that. That's the rule. Pasquantino hits one sharply and grabbed on the glove side by Torres. No, goes under the glove and out to right field where Gallo will get it back in. You, know, you see Glaber Torres makes such good plays and at times it's almost like a concentration thing. You know, late in the game, ball just goes under your glove. A much better fielder than this, and it just uh, the the play wasn't made, and it should have been. And uh, there's sometimes, I'm sure that Aaron Boone sees the same thing that Glaber just kind of loses concentration in the field. So here's Taylor. And a strike. Well, tomorrow it's going to be Jordan Montgomery against the veteran Zach Greinke. Greinke was actually scheduled to pitch this game. But when they activated Heasley, they put him in for today and move Greinke to tomorrow. So that game will be on yes at 135. Our coverage starts at 1230. So tune in. Montgomery trying to bounce back from a subpar outing against the Mets. Fly ball, right field. Coming on is Gallo. Still coming, still coming. And he makes the play in foul territory for the first out. Joey Gallo kind of talking to himself. You know, a lot of things going on here with the sun, the wind. He, to me, looks much more natural in right field than he does in left. Melendez takes outside, 1-0. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
This copyrighted telecast presented by authority of the New York Yankees and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the New York Yankees. A very, very, very late disclaimer. I was getting nervous. Do you know, John, that there are people out there that were ready to reproduce and retransmit and disseminate, <laughs> but I stopped them dead. <laughs> I got the retransmit, but disseminate, <laughs> you lost me. Two and one on Melendez. Can we get an early disclaimer tomorrow so we can get it out of the way? Just relax and enjoy ourselves. It gets you nervous? It does. It gets right. me a little nervous coming down the stretch. Our producer is a gambler. He likes to take it right to the end. Could have been a double play ground ball there. Yeah. We've been big trouble. A lot of disseminating. <laughs> two and two. Yeah, you might have had to come back and do it on the replay. <laughs> Just you, you alone in the booth. Two and two count on Melendez. He's 0 for 2 with a walk. Oh, nice stab there on the backhand by Trevino. There's no let up in Jose Trevino behind the plate. It's been a long afternoon. Down and in the backhand, and he's thinking about the pick at first, decides against it. Would you have been less tired, John, if you, you caught on one knee like that rather than crouching all the time? I, I, I don't think it would have made that much of a difference. They say it does eliminate some of the fatigue, but I mean, by the time you get to this level, you're so used to catching your normal style. There's ball four as Melendez walks. That moves Pasquantino to second. Well, from personal experience, John, I, I caught Ken Singleton's first pitch last year, and I did it on one knee, and I felt a lot better. What are your Great framing days. metrics? Did you did you rate you positively on the I framing metrics? I rated very positively. A lot of defensive run save. <laughs> this game's getting out of hand. We got Michael <laughs> K. catching. We got yes. <laughs> Here's Garcia. Swing and a miss. 0 and 1. Yankees lead 8 to 2. Nestor Cortez, if the Yankees hold on, will get the win. And if Clark Schmidt gets these last two outs, he'll get the save. All right, John, why don't you and Paul break it down for the people? Here it is. See, see what you think. Down on one knee. Beautiful scope. Oh! <laughs> now, how'd you get up off that knee? They get up. Ah, oh, it hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. <laughs> See, I look at what that right there, and Michael could have totally picked Singy up, right? If you get the ball out in front, you maybe eliminate the bounce. He let it travel so deep, Paul. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting it. it. I look at it the other way. If he had missed it, Singy would have felt horrible watching, picking it up at the backstop. I mean, it bounced right in front of home plate. Reach See, out but, front, get the low strike. But here's the deal, John. I employ the same catching theory as I do hitting. I let the ball let travel, the ball travel deep. Yeah. Gotcha. Paul knows. Well, that ball was behind you, so if you're going <laughs> to hit that ball, you're, you're in trouble. Here's Ryan O'Hearn, pinch hitting for Nicky Lopez. 1 0. Just try, everybody. Try to get a compliment out of Flaherty. It's not easy. <laughs> Even O'Neill will throw a crumb every now and then, but not John. <laughs> I gave you a compliment on your description of the sky and the clouds. So you want two today? I'd I like gave to, you yes. One. Gave you one.
One and one on the pinch hitter, O'Hearn. First and second. Royals down to their final out. 2 1. And the 2 1 pitch. Down to their final strike. 2 1 2. Last couple of innings, the lights on here at the stadium because of the shadows. A crowd of what was 44,081. Most of them standing, looking for strike three, looking for the end of the game, looking for the Yankees' 69th win of the year. Although the starter gave them five innings, the Yankees kind of reset their bullpen for tomorrow if need be. And then the Mariners come to town, then the Yankees head to St. Louis after an off day on Thursday. The 2 2. Strike three. Ball game over. Yankees win 8 to 2. Another day, another Aaron Judge home run, another Yankee victory. And they go to 69 and 33 on the season. Judge with his 200th career home run and his 42nd home run of the year. And on a daily basis, Paul, doing amazing things. Well, this was very businesslike today. This is kind of what you expected with the Royals coming in town. The first two games, very exciting at the end. But, you know, Aaron Judge just continues to put up numbers. The Yankees continue to win. Very good day in the Bronx. And John, this is the Yankees' 23rd win by five or more runs. That ties the Dodgers.